You're listening to Real Folk with me, Jo Burke. So welcome to Custard HQ. I'm with lovely Lynn Ray. Sounds like a ray of sunshine, which is mm-hmm. what she is. And um, you found us okay on the oh, on high street? It was a doddle. It was an absolute <laughs> doddle. And as soon as I parked and I walked up the, the street, it just suits you down to a T. Oh, thank Colourful, you. bright, breezy. <laughs> Quaint. That's what we are, <laughs> quaint, but yeah. it's a lovely old cobbled street, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's lovely. It's great. It yeah. always reminds me of Edinburgh, that's another reason I love it. So I reckon, I had this long list, I said to Lynn, mm-hmm. could you just write me a little list of things that you do? And, and I had this amazingly uh, long list of a diverse background. And again, that's what I love about doing these podcasts. The people that serve you in the shops or that are stood next to you at the tube station or, or any walk of life, uh, so many different things. You tend to just take people at their original face value as, as what you see them yeah. in relation to your life. And a case in point is when I do these and I ask people to write a few notes about what they've done and it's always amazing. Mm-hmm. So let's start with the makeup artistry, shall we? <laughs> well, the the reason that started was because I studied, I, I didn't know what to do when I left school. We, we, we didn't really have a very good careers department. So I decided to do hairdressing and beauty therapy, which as soon as I started studying, I realised it wasn't me. It was too female orientated, too much about beauty. But, you know, it was a three-year course, so I learned lots of stuff that I've actually used continued to build on over the years but my um, boyfriend at the time who became my husband was in advertising and I was working in Selfridges I think at the time doing body work he'd been on this photo shoot he came away saying you know just been on this photo shoot with and we've met this makeup artist and she's getting paid so much per day and I'm sure you could do what she does what she was getting paid per day was what I got paid a month (gasps) so I thought I'm going to go. Yeah. So so I thought, I'll take the morning off work, pretend that I'd got an appointment. So I was working for Clarins at the time. So I toddled along to this photography studio in my little white overall, little red hanky and <laughs> stockings. Didn't even know to be embarrassed about that and get there. And, you know, of course, everyone's super cool in a studio or wearing black or jeans and super casual. And anyway, obviously, I hung around for the morning and nothing had happened. So in the end, I took the day off and... Um, I love this I love the vibe of it so I made that decision to do that yeah um, and it was always fascinating but what I what I got from um, doing that job was it was more about the people because for me when I was doing the job was you get someone you meet them when they're at their most vulnerable mm. and you see the real person yeah and and what you were saying about um, you never know what's behind a person yeah and you know I, I ended up being very lucky I worked with a lot of music music people famous people and and to have the privilege of seeing them at their most vulnerable yeah, um, yeah. and also when you're there on a one-to-one basic with basis with someone and they're they're kind of pure and undressed you know that the conversations are so different yeah so did you notice a massive difference between people from when they're sat completely yeah. bare to, yeah. to when you've done your job yeah, and then they absolutely. go absolutely that they become they become you know they go into character yeah it, it was um humbling you know I, yeah. I loved it and also not only that you are I quickly realized that you are probably the most one of the most important people to of them. the day yeah. because you know, that person's just got out of bed, they're tired, um, they're naked, yeah. and they've got a whole day's work to do. If you create the right kind of zone and vibe around them and help them feel nurtured and, and calm, calm and yeah. loved, yeah. then they're, you know, they're, they're great for day. the rest yeah. of the day. Whereas if you're, if you piss them off, <laughs> and the, the whole day's, you know, gone yeah. for everyone else. So, yeah. so I, I just love the connection part of it really more than anything else yeah it's amazing and obviously I do acting work I'm, I'm shooting at a commercial tomorrow actually and uh the day after and it's it's always that thing because you do it's exactly right you've been picked up in a car you've been yeah. driven probably for an hour at like five in the morning and you you s- sat down at six in the makeup chair yeah. and everything's swirling around you and it is so nice if somebody there is just got everything under control mm. and it's just like you know, you, over to me now and yeah. you can have a little chat about stuff. And you stuff. can relax because actually, you know, a makeup brush can be quite vicious if, yes. it's, if it's prodded at you in the wrong way. And yeah, yeah. in the morning, you, you feel very sensitive yes. and, and it only takes one prod. And I, I remember sometimes, you know, there's always a bit of a rush at the end and, 
and sometimes you're there and there's a hair person there and you might be between takes and and you know I've had the person in the chair kind of almost stomp and say get off me mm. because yeah, there's so many much. people on them yeah so you have to become very aware of people's personal space and the need to hold back and do as minimal as possible. So, yeah. you know, you do learn to read people yeah. quite well. Yeah, it is, it's really interesting. And who out of anyone that you, you worked with during that time had was the most different when they were re the real them to when they were the like switching on the performer? Oh. There was one band that I, I worked with once and there were there were guys and I looked their name up a while ago. And anyway, they, they were kind of, you know, dark eye makeup. Uh, you know, when they wear the jeans below their bottom, and <laughs> real kind of grungy, hip hop -y type. Right. And the first time, I, so I'd seen the pictures and I was thinking, oh my God, you know. And, and also, you know, I'd kind of come out of the industry by then and I was I was a mom and, you know, just doing bits and pieces. Yeah. And I was, God, you know, I'm a bit nervous about working with these guys. Anyway, the first time I met them, I had to knock on someone's bedroom door at the hotel and this guy on the, the door looking about 12 <laughs> and, he, and he had a little bit of smudged makeup under his eyes and his hair was kind of flat and he was wearing a dressing gown and and I <laughs> thought we're all the same we we're all the same you know? yeah yeah. It's, yeah that's the thing isn't it there's no and again during these podcasts that when I've been chatting to people it's that whole thing that they everyone is ordinary there is no yeah. really there's nothing special about yeah. anybody because everyone is special exactly you and know? hardships and pain and suffering you know they, they, they don't just they target everyone yeah it doesn't matter how much money you've got exactly. how much of a glamorous job you've got no pain still we can, still have to deal yeah. with the same things yeah it's really interesting and so when you went on to the pilates side of thing was that what was the transition towards um, the, the the kind of biggest job i had before having children was i was working with bros oh of course which was <gasps> you know it was such good fun so i i traveled around the world with them Did I traveled you? around America with them oh we had a, an amazing time and, and adorable you know we were like a family and then they brought out another album and actually I was in America I was in New York with them when my husband proposed to me oh, he flew out in the middle of our stay there amazing. and and then I came back to the UK and I got pregnant well so I got married I got pregnant and so throughout my pregnancy I was working with them up until like the week before I went into hospital to have a C-section. Oh my goodness. And, um, and then I carried on doing, not not for them, because the, the, their album didn't do so well, and that was kind of their, slowed it through quite fast in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I carried on doing some advertising work, and I'd do the odd music work while they were, while they were at school, but it was quite difficult finding childcare because I didn't want a full-time nanny. No, it's just ad hoc, and, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I just really it was I really hated it when I couldn't drop them off at school and certainly when I couldn't pick them up yeah and you know I'd be hanging around on this really long day not knowing when I was going to finish thinking I don't want to be hanging around here I don't care what I'm getting paid I want to mm. be with my kids and then so I started training to do sports massage therapy ah. and then during that training that's when I split up with my ex-husband um so I hadn't actually planned that I was going to need to make a living out of that. It was more a transition. Mm. Um, and so I had no choice really, um, but for that to be my new career. Yeah. Um, and so I did the sports massage remedial as well. And I did Pilates just happened to come because a friend was doing organizing a course and, and we'd already, we were doing um, Pilates type exercises as remedial you know for the sports massage and yeah I never thought I'd want to be a teacher because I'm far too shy and I don't like being in the public I like to be behind the scenes behind the and scenes I don't like talking thing. yeah yeah um I've got a bit used to it now yeah <laughs> I was just gonna say um and and so so that all kind of came together and and I thought I can control the hours I work yeah and be around be there for my kids which was so important when when I became a single mom of course yeah, um, yeah. so I could you know control it and and then, you know, that became quite exciting as well because I ended up doing some work with the the Olympic sailing and windsurfing squad. Amazing. Yeah, and I went on a couple of regattas with them, but it wasn't really for me because um, of my kids. Right. Um, and their dad was away a lot, so I was the stable yeah. influence in Very their life. And, and so I focused on the massage and, and yeah, I, I, I loved it and... Pilates I had um, at home because I kept the the marital home 
and I turned the downstairs into a studio. So I used to teach Pilates from home, from home, and, and do the massage from home. Plus, I worked in a sports clinic as well, and 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 that gave me huge confidence. And when you're teaching Pilates and doing massage, you kind of really understand the body as a moving. It's really thing. holistic, then. Yeah. yeah amazing yeah. absolutely amazing and then now I notice that you, you're uh, doing something to, with the jaw which I yeah. find really interesting because I don't know dear listeners um, if anyone else is doing this but I have developed and it is I, to, if I'm really honest I was doing it a little bit before the lockdown to be honest but during this whole escapade we'll call it uh, I've noticed that I've stuck stuck in my teeth and um and my jaw is even more tense. Mm. I mean I think a lot of people hold their tension in their jaws anyway. I know I know for me it's my jaw and my shoulders. Yeah. I wear my shoulders for earrings quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so I was really interested when I saw that you've been concentrating yeah. on jaw work. So was that sort of a, a transition, a natural progression? Um the reason I decided to um focus on on the jaw was because I first got diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000, the end of 2008. And the hardest thing, apart from obviously telling my kids and my loved ones and my dad, because I lost my mom to breast cancer, um, apart from telling them, the, one of the hardest things I had to do was cross my name out of the diary at the clinic where I was working. And so that, you know, the first time I crossed it out for six weeks, because the first thing I had was surgery. And, and then obviously, you know, it was a couple of years, over a year, I think, before I was able to go back there. But luckily, because I was working from home, I did work. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to crawl into my studio oh. after after my chemo and, you know, and, and teach my clients. And I, I probably did far too much too soon. But I, I realized that um, I needed to... Earn, be able to earn my money in, in a bit of a less physical way yeah so I'd always been really interested in the face obviously and for, for quite a few years I'd I'd known about the face and about the jaw and mm. so so I kind of put it out there that I wanted to do a course on working intraorally um, because I've heard someone once when I was at college someone someone just came in and you know the things that that you remember yeah. and, he, and this guy said that he'd done this course at the weekend where um, it was an intraoral course for the, releasing the jaw and the effect it had on the posture was amazing. So and interesting. Posture has always been my kind of thing, you know, rather than sport, it's right. been posture. So, you know, hence Pilates, the, mm. the combination. And so one day in my inbox, this course, you know, p- um, post-grad course came um, and I thought I have to do it. Yeah. So I did it and then I had quite a clear diary because I was still recuperating from all my treatment um I'd done this course I'd done my studying I had I was ready for clients but how do you bring the clients to you um for my 50th I went on this yoga holiday and with a friend and I met this journalist um and we connected a little bit and then a year later I I got re-diagnosed my cancer came back stage four I um sorry it's all right it's all right um my cancer came back stage four and um so I decided I needed to go on another yoga holiday so I picked the same one and the journalist that I'd met previously was on that one one, so it was meant to be that's that's clearly the universe saying hey guys get together yeah and there were two two really life-changing things that happened with that meeting the first one is she induced she introduced me to this amazing holistic healing doctor um, who I I owe my life to. She said that she was writing for the Stella magazine at the time, and she said, "Oh, I'm, I'm you know I'll, I'll put I'll put you in treatment of the week, which is a tiny little thing." And I said, "Great." Anyway, that was forgotten about, but I went to see Raj, the guy when I when I came home. And my God, has he changed my life? Really? Um, yeah, amazing. Because I focus now on my health and well-being rather than, you know, what what the doctors say, which they give you a, um, okay, well, you're on palliative care now. There's no cure. Um, whereas I go and see him, and, and it's all about reframes it into yeah, being a positive yeah, thing about yeah, what we can do now. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. 
which is so important. I mean, I think most people, even if they, they haven't had it themselves, have known people close to them that have been diagnosed with cancer. Obviously, some will have survived, some some will have not. My own dad, as anyone that's listened to any of these previously, I, I lost him to leukemia and I was 22. And it's the same thing. You get to a certain point and then you have rounds of chemo and it either works or it doesn't. And then mm. at some point, if it doesn't work, they go, well, that's all we can do. Yeah. Um, and so often you, you're just like, well, OK, you know, and it's it's all about a decline and about what all, everything is negative about it. Yeah. And I, and obviously it's a tough thing and people don't like speak. It's still a taboo subject. Mm. We don't, we're not happy speaking about it to each other, to even close family. And interestingly with my own father, my mum and dad who had been married by that point, about 27 years, they never spoke about it. Mm. They didn't speak no. about what was going to happen, about the illness. It was just proper head in the sand, yeah. just getting through each day as it came and, and no preparations, no honest discussions about it and no help with that either. Mm. You know, So that's so interesting that you've yeah. got luckily enough to meet this lady yeah. that then uh, got you in touch with this yeah. doctor that obviously has a very different take on those mm. things, which sounds to me like a really healthy take. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, when my, my mum got cancer when she died in 2001 I, yeah she died in 2001 so probably six years before that she got cancer she was 63 when she died so very young you know we didn't talk about it it was like this big sea that's there yeah it's around you and and you're too scared to talk about it and when even when we knew that she was going to die it was like this fear of talking about yeah. it and um yeah so so her death was unspoken it's uh, such a strange and then thing when my dad got it um he he passed away four years ago now i think and because i'd been through what i've been through with my own health um it was so much more peaceful so much more because there was there was nothing left unsaid yeah you know and so um it's really important to it's really important to to listen to what the doctors say, but you know they can they can give you a very definitive idea of what they expect to happen to you. And I remember um, being in the going to see the oncologist for my results. It was seven years ago now when they um, they told me I had to have some surgery and they put a video camera inside me and deflated my lung and put tubes in to take away all the fluid that was collecting and then sent me home with another tube that I kept for nine months. I, I knew that that I'd got cancer because the, the doctors had done the biopsy and I knew it was back, you know, in my in my chest. And and I remember going to see the oncologist afterwards with my son and he said, you know, Felix, you know, I'm I'm being as kind as I can. You know, we're looking we're looking to give you your mum as many years of quality life as we can um but it's you know it's palliative we, we can't cure her we can just make her comfortable and it all sounds very end of life yes and then there's and how you know, long ago was that seven years there you go yeah and see that's the thing is i find it very difficult to accept it when doctors give you a definitive like you're saying because actually you don't know no you don't know i mean obviously they're basing it on past experiences and on averages yeah. and things but everyone deals with that information differently but I also do think that if they dealt with it slightly more positively they might have more positive outcomes as well yeah. because I think so many people I'm probably like you I'm the opposite if someone says to me well that's going to be the end in certain time I'll go like, well is it now <laughs> do yeah. you, you know yeah. I've got that kind of attitude to yeah. authority and being told what's yeah. going to happen in my me life too. me too but so many people haven't no th and so and I think a lot say, of people yeah they're, they're given okay well you've got six months and people live it to the yes, day because it, because the, it's that's in their what head yeah yeah and it's, it's so and that's scary. what's frighteningly dangerous to me because it's exactly that yeah. you know if you're open to suggestion in mm. that way and if you truly believe there is mm. no hope yeah. that you know because that's more or less what they're saying and I yeah. know they're only doing their job and they're basing it on averages as I've said before and it's how they've always dealt with it but I think really and truly if if somebody has got 
to the extent where there isn't anything else that you can do, don't give them a figure or a number mm. on when they expect your time to be up because it's mm. it's a highly unlikely to be true. But B, if it's not gonna, if it if it is true, it's becoming true because it's what they believe. Yeah, because yeah. your mind is so powerful. Mm. For me, and speaking to you and other other people that have, have dealt with this, mindset is so important. Yeah. And your brain is the biggest muscle, and we yeah. still don't really fully know about our brains. What you believe does come to pass you know oh absolutely to, to, Definitely. to much yeah. bigger extent than anyone else anyone yeah. out there usually thinks yeah well I've, I've used um i i used i there was a guy called david hamilton who he, he wrote a book on how the mind can heal the body and the first time i had my tube my drain um and, and my tumors you know and i was i was my body was making fluid to to heal the tumors and I didn't know how long this drain was going to stay in me, you know, and but I hated having it. So I'd met him at the, the Haven and I followed his methods of um, visualization. So every day I would do a meditation and I would visualize my tumors shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And over the nine months, I, I could see them um, coming smaller. And some people visualize a battle. Yeah, I, I couldn't. It was always it always had to be peaceful for me, and I used to talk to them. Yeah, I used to talk to my mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, so I did it, and and gradually they got smaller and smaller, and and eventually I had the tube removed, and and I I met him later and I told him what I'd done, and when he rewrote his How the Mind Heals the Body book, he put my story in it. Really amazing. Yeah. But unfortunately, at the time when he sent me the book. I just found out that my cancer had reactivated. This was a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half ago now. And uh, and I was building fluid again. And so I couldn't bring myself to open the book because I felt like a fraud. You know, uh. I, thought, I thought I've let everyone down. I've let myself down. And I was so disappointed with myself. Anyway, I went back to the hospital and they they talked about putting the tube back in and I, and I said no I don't want it because I thought if it goes in it'll never come out and and then I went away on holiday um with my partner and breathing was a little bit difficult but I was kind of determined to not let it bother me and I start so I when I was on holiday I read the David, David Hamilton book uh-huh. and, and but I didn't look at my part until I got to it and by then I was ready to read it yeah and I felt very emotional when I read it. And then okay. at the end of the book, he recommended reading this other book by Joe Dispenza. He's written a book called You Are the Placebo, but it wasn't, that wasn't the one I read. Anyway, I thought, that's what I'm going to read next. Yeah. And anyway, I looked on my Kindle and it was already there. So, so you already downloaded it? I must have downloaded it a couple of years yeah. ago, thinking I'm going to read this book. Yeah. And so I thought, this is a sign. So I started reading that book. His thing is all about the brain. The brain does not know what is real and what is visualization. Yeah. And if your visualization is powerful and real enough, so you have to visualize it, you have to believe it, but you have to feel the emotions that go along with that visualization, then it becomes true, right, but you yeah. have to keep repeating. It's like medicine. Mm. And um, and I went to Australia that Christmas and they had to take some fluid out of my lung before I went so I could fly. And then when I came back, the fluid was getting worse and I, I was really struggling to breathe until I think it was February and, and I could barely put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. It was so bad. And so I had to have the tube put back in and they, they removed over four litres of fluid. <laughs> so I, lost, wow. I lost a few pounds, which was really nice. But actually, as soon as... <laughs> I they, love that I, you I just know, said that. I couldn't wait to weigh myself, you know, as female. <laughs> I'd accept that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've got, you've got, to, laugh about these. You've exactly. got to laugh about these things. There's always humour. Yeah. And um, anyway, we um, once the pain of, for having the tube put in had gone, we went to um, Norfolk for a weekend that we'd had to cancel. And my, my fiance said, oh, we, um, we used to bring our dogs here. And you know, they, they couldn't believe it because there's all the big skies and the big beaches. And he said, um, they, they thought they'd died and gone to heaven. You know, sometimes they'd get three or four walks a day. 
and I said, well, just pretend I'm your dog, you know, and <laughs> and and we, I just want to walk, every, yes. you know, and we just walked and walked and walked, and and it was just such a joy to be able to walk. Yeah, I couldn't stop. I no. felt like Forrest Gump. <laughs> oh, but that, it's so strange, though, isn't it? Because when you when you feel like you're denied something, it it makes you want the those things even more, doesn't it? You know, yeah. it makes you fight for everything. Yeah, well, what what I really that time in particular, because I've never, I've never very rarely look look at the face of death, you know, because I there's a fear of once you actually look at it, then you're, you're heading that way. But but this time I was struggling so much to breathe, which is your it's your life force, isn't of it? Course. And and breathing and walking for me, if I can't do either of those two things, then what's the point of being alive? And and I really went to the dark side, and I really. You know, I, I I felt the pain of what my kids were going through. Yeah. Um, I really felt it. And I know they thought that, uh, that I was on my way. So when that's turned around and you've really actually gone to the dark side and you've, you've actually thought that your time's coming to an end, to suddenly have it given back to you is like, it's making my goose, goose pimples yeah, now. Yeah, me too. Um, it's like, wow, you really appreciate what this life is what a gift it is you yeah. know and yeah. and and you know you just want to then live your best life and make yeah. the most of it yeah although covid doesn't help COVID does doesn't it? help but the, the thing is those experiences i always think you wouldn't wish those experiences on your worst enemy but almost you do wish that most people could understand because because none of us know no. what day is going to be our last day no. but we all behave as if we've got this mountain of time in front yeah, of us yeah. to do any manner of things and we put things on hold yeah, and oh, we we'll, don't do we'll things. We'll do that next year or... We'll yeah. Do, yeah, and, and it's like, you know, know, this pandemic that we're going through is a case in point. You know, who would have said three, four months ago that we'll be living like we are yeah. now? And that's why it's so important to make the most of every single yeah. minute. And it sounds such a cliche and so cheesy, but it's so bloody true. And, you know, as I've said before, my kick up the arse was losing my dad at 22. Yeah. And like, similar to your mum, he was only 59. You know, mm. he didn't make 60. And he was fit and healthy, yeah. uh, didn't smoke, didn't drink. He rode his bike to work every day. Um, and up until that point, I just naively thought, well, if you're fit and healthy, you'll yeah. see sort of late 70s, 80s, because mm. I was just so naive. And then something like that happens. And I think you either go one of two ways. You either look at things what as in, in a what's the point then of anything yeah. or you go okay i get this i get yeah. i get this now so okay none of us know mm. let's just do all of the things <laughs> as soon as we can <laughs> yeah. well well my my guru my my holistic doctor you know he says you're either a victim or you're a seeker and that's a good thank one, god it? i think i was i was a victim for a while after my husband went off and because it was about the same time as my mum dying and that was a hard time of course and I became a victim for a while god you know what have I done wrong you know who was ever gonna love me and uh. yeah anyway I, I managed to get over that and and thank god now that I, I just feel blessed blessed that I'm a seeker because yeah. I I now I really now don't believe that cancer is going to be the reason that I die I really believe that I'm going to be old you know I really look forward to the future yeah and um, that's so important yeah although you know for everyone right now it's it's really difficult because you know i've had to cancel my wedding well postpone my wedding um the new date is is looking you know touch and go well, yeah. yeah but i guess that's that's why we just have to live for today and yeah. and, and enjoy what what we can do right now and yeah. um yeah and count, count the blessing yeah absolutely you're listening to Real Folk with me, Joe Burke. This would ordinarily be an advertising break, but as I don't yet have an advertiser, why not check out standingoncustard.com where you can buy all four of my children's books plus my adult comedy book about online dating, all delivered free and signed by me. Standingoncustard.com. Back to the show. The whole a victim um, seeker thing which I find really interesting and I think that's a really good point and it's almost a bit like that old adage isn't it you're either a drain or a radiator yeah, in life yeah. and it's, this, it's yeah. for me it's a similar thing you either yeah. make the best of things or you go this is shit I'm going to make it shitter yeah. look, look for the lessons <laughs> yeah, yeah look for the 
look for the positives yeah. in things and I think the what you look for you find. Yeah. I guess the first the first diagnosis of cancer was two thousand and eight. So so, so um, but I've been on borrowed time for seven years. Seven years, yeah. yeah. So I mean that in itself is amazing. But what you can't see, dear listeners, uh, well you will see because I will add a little photo of Lynn. But Lynn seems to be sort of some sort of Benjamin Button as well <laughs> <laughs> because she's sitting here talking about being an old lady, and I'm like, yeah, sure, sure, you'll be eighty, but you'll still look like that, you bugger, because she's got the most amazing face. And if if it's not an advert for your jaw work and your <laughs> facial yoga and goodness knows what, I don't know what else is because. You're, how old are you, Lynn? 58. 58. I mean, seriously, <laughs> just no. Just no. Have a look. Go and have a look at the photos, listeners. I'll give you a moment. Have a look at the photos. 58. Honestly, you look about 20 years younger than that. It's ridiculous. That's very sweet. Absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So when can I do the facial yoga? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> well I have, I've been teaching facial exercises on and off for years, but I've never really done them myself unless I'm teaching them. Um, and then during the lockdown, I because I'm a physical therapist, I couldn't work. Yeah. And friends had kept saying, um, "Will you teach us some face exercises?" So I, I, you know, I kind of decided to download Zoom, and I, I started. I invited all the like friends, all the people I thought might be interested, not yeah. really clients, more more friends and colleagues. And um, and I had a group, an overall group of about sixteen to eighteen people. And, and I did three classes a week. And this lasted for about 12 weeks, I think. People were, because of lockdown, of course, people were really yeah. dedicated. Yeah. Some, and stressed some, and so yeah, brilliant Some thing. did it twice a week and some did it once a week. And then a couple kind of, a few drifted off, you know, just tried it a few times. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I offered it, you know, quite cheap because I wanted to learn. Anyway, I loved doing it. Zoom is an amazing platform for teaching it because, you know, teaching... Um, exercises to people you, you have to gather them all together whereas mm. this they can do it in the comfort of their own home yeah, yeah. and when you're doing the face on zoom they get a great look at me but they mm. also get a great look at themselves yes also the the group I was doing it I had someone from um I had some from Perth Melbourne no way so yeah. international so people, people are all over you oh. know and, and they're all on the screen and some people knew each other. Some people knew of each other. So it was a really social Interesting, thing. Interesting, yeah. Um, but but you get a really good view, and you, you're focused, and um, and it was really great. It's brilliant. So so I've been doing exercises, and it really does make a difference. Fabulous. Uh, and it's the way. It's the only way. You know. So Lynn, when can I join this? <laughs> when <are> you... <laughs> And listeners, because honestly, look at the face. Look at the face, listeners. Look at the face. <laughs> no Botox, no fillers, no nothing. Just no, natural, all natural beauty. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we've got it all inside and we're all capable of this, listeners. So let's, Lynn, how do we do this? <laughs> well, how do we reach you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you my details. <laughs> but but the, the thing about, about it is that whenever I've, everything I've done about with the face, it... It has to come from the inside, you know. Right. Beauty truly is on the inside. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned from my whole um, cancer uh, life, yep. all the things that have happened to me is, and I'm still learning it now, as my fiancé will testify to, <laughs> I'm not the easiest person to, to have around, um, learning to love yourself. and. Yeah. You know, I had had to go through it when I had lots of surgery um, to do with the cancer. Um, so my body, my body was changed dramatically overnight. Um, and when you're single, that's not not easy. No, no. Um, so I had to physically learn to love myself. But that, in a way, that's the easiest part. Um, and the the joy of having big things happen to you means that small things you don't, don't sweat mean the small anything. stuff. Yeah. No. Um, but the hardest thing is learning to love who you are and and that and that is one of the biggest lessons about about the cancer as well I think because um, if you if you love yourself then you know you it affects the way you eat you know I nurture myself with good food yeah um, I've had to I don't have sugar or dairy I don't eat meat you know I drastically change my diet to be healthy I I I do drink um, champagne and dry white wine. <laughs> well, um, of course. And my doctor, he's 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 realised that totally you know, behind that, not yeah, going to knock that out. Yeah, it's not his. Yeah. 
um, I've given up so many other things that, you know. Yeah. Um, I exercise and I exercise not not to, well, my exercise is generally keeping on top of my surgery. So it keeps me functioning. But, you know, I do yoga and Pilates and I walk a lot. All, all things that make me feel really good from the inside. Yeah. Um, and, and with the face, it's, um, you know, fr from a jaw perspective, if you're if you're clenching your teeth, then you're stressed. So um, all my experience in life really helps kind of get to the bottom of, of why people are doing what they're doing. Because, you know, OK, I can get my hands on you and I can make you feel a lot better. Mm. But we have to work together on it and understand why you are doing what you're doing. To prevent it, in um, to the first prevent second. it, yeah, and so then the, yeah, that's where the exercises come in, so that you can you can make positive changes, and it's much easier to add positive good habits into your lifestyle than it is to drop. I mean, if I said to you, you know, stop lose doing your it. jaw tension, stop clenching your teeth, you wouldn't know where to start because no, a, a your brain has forgotten what it feels like to be untense. So the yeah. massage helps you, you know, it reminds your brain, oh god, that feels yeah. so nice. And then you've got the lessons that help you to do other things that um, release tension, strengthen yeah. and create more balance. It's um, so weird because even just looking at you, <laughs> I can feel, yeah. I can feel how I know. It's like when you talk I about can, the pelvic floor, isn't yeah. it? It instantly goes on. <laughs> it's so, so bizarre. It's li literally, yeah. I can feel all the tension in my jaw now. And I'm like, ah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, of course, obviously trying to a massage will make it feel great but it's not going to stop you yeah. doing it so you do need to learn it's about taking responsibility and, but and to stop yeah yes this, this current situation hasn't helped at all no. <laughs> i mean it's created a mountain of people out there who need help yeah but then it's only very recently that i've actually been able to get my hands on people yeah. again yeah and, and you know it's very different it's not it's not you know i like to be flexible with my time yeah. i like to sit and talk to people i like to do things slowly and gently and add little bits on here and there mm. whereas now it's doing the consultation on zoom to minimize contact time wearing a mask mm. um you know yeah and they're all stressful things i mean i had a i had to have root canal so I, I had root canal started just before the lockdown so i had to have a temporary thing that got me through yeah. lockdown and then yeah. as soon as they the dentist could finish it off they did, but there was like a four month gap yeah. where I was, it was a little bit painful, but not too painful. Um, but when I went back to have it finished, I mean, I'm not terrified of the dentist or anything, but they had full on like gas mask things that they were wearing that looked, I mean, seriously, they yeah. looked terrifying to look at. They couldn't hear each other, the mm. dental nurse and the dentist. So he would be asking for things and yeah. she would be, you know, and I'm sitting there with my mouth wired, you know, with a yeah. thing in my mouth. It's like being caught in a horror film, oh, isn't it? Oh, it seriously was. One of was. those awful futuristic films it, that I've always hated watching. It absolutely was. Yeah. And um, the only thing that got me through it, and I'm not normally frightened of the dentist, was literally what we were saying earlier, visualisations. I had to take yeah. myself away because yeah. the reality of what was going on was so stressful mm. to me yeah. and I just wanted to rip it off of my face and run out of there yeah. as fast as I could but I also had a massive toothache so I knew yeah. I needed to I know. <laughs> I needed to do and so this little light that they shine at you it had these these funny little shadow things and it and it I made it look like a face yeah so it looked like a little friendly dog's yeah, face yeah. looking at me yeah. and that was how I got through yeah. it I was like I'm sitting here looking at this strange sort of futuristic dog yeah. thing and that was that was how I did it's it it's amazing yeah but that's what I always goodness. do when I'm having scans and things and treatments yeah. I remove myself from my body and travel somewhere, somewhere else yeah. and I did that because I had to have uh, an MRI um, and that's so long isn't it and and it and I was in agony having it yeah. as well because I was it was for some pains I was having in my shoulders and they didn't know what it was and I already had nerve pain and then yeah. you go through those and it, it's, yeah. it's really loud MRIs yeah, anyone horrible, that's had yeah. one uh, and also sort of rattly they're yeah. just it, it's just like the they, they let you thing. play music but you can't hear it uh well actually i didn't have any music i all i had was this noise of the machine mm. um and i'm a bit claustrophobic and yeah. so that's the worst place to be yeah. it's like being put inside a tumble dryer and the only thing that got me through that as well was there was so much noise 
in the end I thought, right, okay, I'm going to pretend that I'm in some sort of video game or yeah. a war film yeah. because that's what it sa- yeah, yeah, sounded like, yeah. bombs going off and yeah, people course, scrabbling. Yeah. And so I just thought, okay, I'm not inside this tumble dryer. I'm yeah. in a in a in some sort of game that the kids play yeah. or something and I'm going to choose which direction <laughs> I'm going and there's people shout, uh, you know, fighting and whatever. Um, and that's how I, I got through it. So I think you just can't underestimate the power of the mind mm. to do those things. I'm not saying that it's for everybody um, and there will be a lot of people that are sceptical about that yeah. but I just do think actually you need to find what works for you and if you are one of those people that um, prefers to have tablets for everything and to, to rely solely on yeah. uh, chemo and, and those types of things then that's that's absolutely fine there's yeah. nothing wrong with that but I think if you do sort of look a bit deeper and travel a bit further into what your own mm. consciousness and subconsciousness yeah. can do uh, you'll probably find that it, it can help you along the way as well as that. As, yeah, exactly. You know, you know the, the the beauty of my doctor is he doesn't he doesn't diss the medical profession. He he works alongside them. Exactly. And, yeah. Um, you know, I've I've had I've done everything the medical profession have asked me to. Well, almost. <laughs> yeah. For 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 years, and and now I've I've stopped my medication now because I just had enough. It was it, the side effects I couldn't bear any longer. Um. So, but I take. You know, I, I, I do my diet, I do my exercise, I do my meditation every day. I go and see my holistic doctor and I've got a, a, a box full of potions that I take every day. But when I take those, I don't feel like I'm taking medicine. I feel like no. I'm putting health into my body. It's positive. It's, yeah. it's a lot more expensive than going to the hospital. But um, I still go there to have scans regularly to yeah. keep an eye on me. And... Um, I think my my oncologist now has kind of accepted the fact that whatever I'm doing, carry it, carry on carry doing on, what you're doing. It's good, you yeah. know. Um, I think that's important as well for for people to understand because it's very easy to get carried away with the authority of doctors, and I'm not dismissing that myself. But yeah. what I am saying is is that you are you, and you can say at any time when you've had enough. Yeah of any treatments that that is enough yeah. you know because I think a lot of people carry on and carry on even when they're making it's yeah. making them ill and that they would have a better quality of life for maybe that last period if they'd stopped it yeah you know and I think some well that's what it is it's quality isn't it yes. and, and I think as long as you're having a quality of life then then that's what's really important I remember when my my um well my mum you know she was put on another course of chemo and and that's kind of what you know so so towards the end of her life she she was a mess mm. um my dad they they wanted him to take some chemo and and I was really strongly against it. against it and and I and I I was probably more persuasive than I should be but yeah. I just really didn't want him to have it and actually he was sent home from hospital and he stayed at my sister's um and we expected him to last weeks and he lasted four months mm. and he had a lovely four months yeah. yeah it was really special yeah and um and you know he was as good as he could be yeah whereas if he'd been on chemo of, often your body's too weak and it's awful it's yeah. absolutely awful yeah. and, and obviously the more of it you have the worse it is yeah. and it's a it's a it's a Hobson's choice isn't it obviously but ultimately as well I was saying this to to mum earlier is you know, none of us are getting out of here alive. No, so we've exactly. all got to go from yeah, something. It's about choosing the quality so, of your death. Isn't yeah, it? and it's about going, do you know what? I, I hear what you're saying, doctor, yeah. whatever. And and I, I'm i also going to have a little listen to, to my own body yeah. about what it's saying that I should do. And yeah. you, you just do what's right for you. Yeah, yeah. we have to listen to our bodies because our bodies absolutely know how to heal. But over the years of being bombarded with pills and drugs and medication and fear yeah we've forgotten yeah you know and our bodies do know they're, they're, they're highly intelligent and they've got a survival instinct but we've stopped listening you know and we just need to be quiet and and you know nature is so valuable and peaceful you know quiet in the mind meditation yeah it's all so healing yeah um it is it's amazing and i think the listening thing is so overlooked because everything in life now is about the rush and the hubbub and there's yeah. there's noise everywhere, like yeah. a white noise yeah. kind of everywhere now and you're bombarded. And 
if you're always on the go, which a lot of us are, and, and it's been made to look like being on the go and, oh, I'm too busy, I'm always busy, is a positive thing yeah. um, in life. Mm. And in actual fact, is it really? Who, who is actually winning yeah. out of this, everyone being busy and having no time? Yeah, well, in, in, my, in my job where, where I'm working with people with their jaws, they come and see me and some people know they're stressed. Some people don't know they're stressed they say oh, I'm not stressed but they say I'm always busy I never sit still and you can see them kind of on the edge of their seat and people are addicted to busyness and you see people on Instagram don't you oh you know 12 hours work I've got to do today you know I've got this to do and, and it's almost like a competition who's the busiest yeah yeah and people are addicted to being busy yeah um, and it's but it's bonkers because yeah. actually the that's not sustainable no. <laughs> and it's not healthy and you're never actually taking that time for yourself yeah and which going people back are to, scared to yeah and going back to what we were saying earlier which is loving yourself that to yeah. me is a, is a huge part of it allowing yourself the time to to get to, to just know yourself kick and back to, and to go sit quietly with yourself yeah and have a look and go actually she's all right that yeah. person in the mirror there you know yeah. she's not perfect you know no, of course that, not. that's the hardest thing isn't it accepting your weaknesses yeah but the point is we've all got them and we're all you know yeah. i you know that you said yourself you know about your partner and you know i know with mine i'm terribly difficult to live with and i'm trying to be nicer <laughs> <laughs> i promise and I, and I will quite often say i'll quite often say to people oh gosh i'm a horrible person and then he'll go no you're not and he'll you say things, a horrible moment yeah <laughs> And it's like, I know, I know I am really, but that, you know, there's good and bad in all of us. And the, my point is we're not, no, none of us are perfect and yeah. we're all human. And of course, you know, some people will have only ever seen the, the nice, bright, bubbly side of me and you, yeah. and very few people get to see the dark, awful moments of yeah. us, uh, but both those sides are okay. Yeah. You know? It's the end of the year. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of one or the other or try to be just mm. one all the time to please anyone else because you have to have those down moments. You have to, I'm sure, uh, with well, your you, whole family, with dealing with cancer, you, you have to cry. You have to you go, have to. do you know what, this is absolute shit and yeah. for a minute, but not yeah. not stay there. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. It's, to, it's the dusting yourself off yeah. and going, okay, that is shit or whatever, yeah. but let's get past this and let's yeah. make this work. Yeah. Um, and that is the hardest thing, actually, because I, I have a tendency, I'm from Yorkshire, um, I have a tendency to be very stoic. And, you know, everyone said, oh, God, you're so brave the way you've dealt with everything that's happened to you and you've just got on and done it. And but that's not brave. You know, there's almost that's almost been weak because you just kind of almost do it like a, being a robot. And now is the hard time because. Obviously, I, I've met someone, I've fallen in love, and I want to spend my life with them, but I want to be real. Yeah. And so I'm having to lose my brave armour that I've developed over the years and, and, and learn to be soft and vulnerable whilst at the same time not being weak and keeping my strength and keeping my balance of, you know, how I've, how I've developed to look after my health. And it's scary. Yeah. And, it's, and it's really difficult to... to balance it all together because you have to trust yourself that that you're okay in all your parts yeah and that you know by being vulnerable you're not going to lose the strong and well there is strength in being vulnerable isn't there yeah a huge amount and but it, it, it is it, I suppose what you're saying really is that it's scary yeah. and that's that is life life is scary yeah, death okay is scary. scary everything is scary yeah. so now I'm Starting. trying to be real yeah, yeah. because I realised that that's the most important thing but facing your own sort of existence well it's renowned not to be very easy isn't it absolutely <laughs> it's, not, yeah. it's not something you're sort of taught yeah. to do and I think it's a shame that you it's yeah we kind of started this with it being a taboo thing and it and it's still it still is, isn't it? Ultimately, yeah. even to yourself. Yeah, uh, it's you like know. it's like your little book with the squirrel. 
You know, My it doesn't Sheraton. matter if you've not got a tail. Doesn't. It doesn't matter. You're and lovable you, anyway. Yeah, you're lovable as you are yeah. and you don't mm-hmm. need to put on a pretend tail. You can just be who you are. Exactly. And uh, mm-hmm. on that note, Lynn's now stroking my sky is is stopped <laughs> making smells and he's now he's now come over for a cuddle and a wag mm-hmm. of the tail. So uh, it's been an absolute joy and pleasure speaking to you, Lynn. Um I knew I knew it would be. Yeah. And I I think you're journey has been incredible you've done so much i mean we, it was really just the tip of the iceberg there's tons of other stuff <laughs> there's tons of other stuff on this I mean, it's like having somebody's cv isn't it i suppose these shows a little bit but mm-hmm. um the beauty of it is coming on and sharing such really personal things i think and i hope listeners are, are helpful because i think we've all been through it either personally or people very close to us it's kind of impossible not to these days it affects so many people and on top of that the <laughs> the killer virus we just mentioned that um <laughs> so people are going through really tough times so i'm hoping that having a listen to people like me and you having a, a chat about life and death and the things that matter yeah is helpful yeah and it was just like a chat. <laughs> it was lovely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Mm-hmm. Thanks, It's worth coming to Folkestone for. <laughs> it's always worth coming to Folkestone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Thanks for listening to Real Folk with me, Joe Burke.